a prayer to the Lord.
desire we crave. Hallelujah. Only for your spirit to dwell, oh God, with us. Lord, we know the privilege it is to be able to lift our voices together, to be able to actually honor you, to sing unto your name, oh God. You are welcome in this house, in our minds, in our hearts. Oh God, take full control. You are welcome in this place. You are welcome. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God at this time. We're going to have um, our scripture reading, so we're going to ask Brother David Mullings to come, and he's going to read from Psalm chapter 103, and he's going to read from verses 1 to 8. Praise the Lord. I'll be reading from Psalms 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, and who healeth all thy diseases. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Who satisfies thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made... He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous, and plenteous in mercy. Thank you. Praise God. The Lord, amen, is plenteous in mercy. Anyone else really happy that he's plenteous in mercy? Amen. I know that. I know I need his mercy every day, all the time. So glad that there's a new mercy every single day. Amen. Glory to God. So I'm glad that we are going to that city of gold. Anyone else glad they're going to a city of gold? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Oh, there's a city that looks for the best. And it's glory.
can't wait. I can't wait to get there. Hallelujah. Whew. When I get there, when I get there, I will sing and shout. When I get there, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. What a glorious day that will be. Hallelujah. Glory to God. What a day that shall be. Hallelujah. Glory. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. What a glorious day. Hallelujah. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore. On that happy golden shore. Oh, what a day. A glorious day that will be. Can we do that one more time? Say, there is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore. On that happy golden shore. Oh, what a day, a glorious day that will be. Oh, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look.
Glory to God, glory to God.
Good morning again, everybody. Do we have any visitors this morning? Meaning, this isn't your home church, so it could be your first time, but it could be your seventh time. If you're a visitor this morning, could you slip up your hand? All right, good morning, good morning, good morning. All right, can we please all stand? And we're going to give you an opportunity to greet each other, greet some visitors, greet some people that are here all the time but you don't get to see all the time and shake someone's hand and welcome them to grace oh greet somebody in jesus name tell them that you love them in jesus name tell them we can work together in jesus name everybody smile can work together in Jesus' name. Everybody, smile, Jesus loves you. Everybody, smile, Jesus loves you. Oh, greet somebody, greet somebody in Jesus' name. Tell them that you love them in Jesus' name. Tell them we can work together in Jesus' name. Everybody, smile. 
greet somebody and hug them or shake their hand. But if you didn't, there's always after service as well. Amen. At this time, we are going to continue and we're going to uh, worship God with our tithes and our offering and our giving this morning. So I'm going to ask Sister Alicia to bless the morning's offering if she doesn't mind. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father, for another day, Lord Jesus. We thank you that we have the opportunity to come on this first Sunday of the year, Lord God, to give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor that is due unto your name. God, we just pray that, Heavenly Father, as we prepare our offering to give to you, Lord God, that you would bless and multiply it to the furtherance of your kingdom, Lord God. Touch those who unfortunately don't have to give, Lord God. We pray that you'll provide for them and make ways so that they will be able to offer up what you have blessed them with. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so you're just going to follow the leading of the ushers as you walk down and drop your offering in the bucket and go back to your seat and continue praising. Hallelujah. Oh, as I journey through the land, singing as I go.
God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This week, I was meditating a little bit on the glory of God. And there's this one scene that you might all be familiar with where Moses asked the Lord, let me see your glory. Remember this? And, what, and God says, you can't see my glory and live. But I'm going to, the very next verse he says, I will make my goodness pass before you. The glory of God is the goodness of God. Amen? The glory of God is the goodness of God in its fullness. Yes. Hallelujah. I can't, I can't, we can't all, we can't imagine what that's going to be like. But we can only imagine. We can only imagine. What will we do? What will we do? Think about that. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes would see when your face is before me I can only imagine I can only imagine mm. Surrounded by your glory What will is be 
Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The Lord bless you. You may be seated. I want to express my gratitude to our praise team and um, our musicians. I'm so thankful for them to always be in the right spirit to get us into the right frame, uh, especially when I have to minister the word of the Lord. I'm so grateful for that. I want to welcome everybody and wish you a happy new year. It's our first Sunday of uh, 2024, and we are truly, truly blessed to be gathered. It's good to see everybody, and welcome to service. Those of you who are visiting with us, we sure am glad to have you with us here today. We have a number of things to do. I almost was tempted to come up um, right after the video announcements to do mine. I am going to minister, but not for very long, but I do have some things that I need to um, share with you that may fall under the category of announcements. Um, as you heard in the video announcements, uh, every year, for those of you who don't know, every year at the start of the year, as a matter of fact, um, I'll take a moment to sort of explain how we run things uh, administratively. Um, we have our year broken up into quarters, and what we try to do is focus on each quarter and um, set, you know, all the goals and all the things that we want to accomplish within that piece, just to sort of bite off as much as we can chew, as the saying goes. And so this um, 
we start obviously the first quarter of 2024. And what we try to do is we try to start every quarter with a time of fasting and prayer and asking the Lord for guidance and success through all the things that we endeavor to do within that quarter. The one in January, uh, while it is a quarterly fast, takes on a greater dimension for some reason, because I suppose it's the start of the year, and so we, we try to look at the whole year um, and begin to set our hearts and minds um, to allow God to do what he needs to do through us uh, for the year. And so our first quarter fast starts tomorrow. And I want to, as I do all, every year, is to take a moment and explain how the fast works because oh, every year, thank God, there are new people and folks who are not familiar with how all this stuff works. Um, one of the things that we probably should do during the, the times of teaching is ex to teach on fasting in particular. Um, but we are going to go into our fast starting tomorrow and the first phase of the fast, so now, we would have sent out something in email. So if you're on our mailing list, you would have received an email with what is called a fasting brochure connected to it. I did print some, and uh, because we have some folks who, you know, this whole digital stuff isn't their thing, um, so they get a physical copy of it. So I I'll just demonstrate what I need to do uh, from the physical copy. And so I'll kind of do like this and say, if the cabin loses pressure, the things above your head, no. <laughs> so, on the fasting brochure, on the first page inside, you're going to see a list of scriptures. And those scriptures or verses apply to morning and evening. In the Old Testament, they would call them sacrifices. In the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice. And... The purpose is, and you'll notice this in some cases, is just one verse of scripture. We'd like you to read something, and please don't be, so we've got one verse. Don't be so busy that it takes less than a minute, some of these verses, to read. And when folks say they're so busy they couldn't even read their verses, that's disturbing. Amen? Oh, it's quiet now. Wait till we get to the preaching. And so, if you can't take 60 seconds to devote to your own spiritual development, you need to look at yourself again. Amen? Because we can binge watch stuff for hours. So, one verse in the morning and in the evening. And if you can, I would like us not just to read it, but we are in consecration Take some time and look at it again. These verses are intentional. Some of them, and they all surround the theme of purpose. That's what we're going to talk about a little bit more in a bit. So you will see the obvious connection with purpose in some verses. Some of them you have to look at it carefully, and you will see it. Um, so that's this page that you will get. The other page explains how the fasting is set up. So the first week, um, which starts tomorrow to the 14th, uh, it, from Monday to the Sunday, uh, we call it a one in 24 hour fast. So what you try to do is have one meal within that 24 hour space. You can choose whatever works best for your body. So if you work, I tell you for me, it's better to have dinner and wait till the next day. Uh, to eat again, because usually, and all the good healthy people are going to jump on me on this, but uh, I have the largest meal of the day at dinner time. Some of you do too, so don't look at me like that. Um, <laughs> so I choose to do that instead of the, like say, the smallest meal, which is breakfast, and then try to do that for 24 hours. It's not going to work uh, for me, but because some days I, I even forget about lunch, I get so busy and then realize I haven't eaten all day, so it, it's kind of easier um, to do dinner. But whatever works for you. However, you will notice also on this page, the highlighted is a, dis a disclaimer or a caution, a medical caution, and it came up in the announcement as well. If, uh, if for any reason you have uh, a physical 
issue or medical issue, then, then as you heard in the announcement, it's not mandatory. I don't want anybody to get sick or go complaining to Sister Sharon and have her on my case that, um, you know, pastor made me do this and now look at what I, no. Um, use wisdom and listen to your body and do what's right. Now, I, I should also extend some caution when I say listen to your body because whenever you fast, whenever you start to discipline yourself to fasting, you'll probably get headaches and you'll probably have to get over some things at first, but, but if you just pull yourself through it, you'll be fine. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Right? So, so your body just kind of reacts naturally to some things, but you have to be wise about it and know what is danger and what is just hunger. Right? Amen? And if you're not sure, well, talk to Sister Sharon. All right. The, the one that comes in after that, the next stage of the fast is called the Daniel fast. Now, this one is different in the sense that you can eat. Um, however, what you can eat becomes a challenge because the Daniel fast is very, very restrictive, and, and there's no meat, no dairy, no sugar, nothing. So you have to pay careful attention to the labels on products to see what you can and can't eat. And I know many people run from the Daniel fast like it's a, some kind of monster uh, and find it much easier to do the 1 in 24. But I think, I think when we do some things, they should have an impact on us, right? And so I like the Daniel fast, not because it's a great you know, thing to do. I find it just as hard to find anything to eat. And, but at least I know to myself, I'm actually disciplining myself to do something. And I can feel it happening. And so I encourage you, even though I know it, you find it difficult, um, you should try to do it. Because you'll find that um, we as a society... Uh, as a nation of people, or the times in which we live, so much of what we consume in terms of food is laden with sugar. Amen? And so we have an epidemic of diabetes. We have an epidemic of all the other medical issues that come with, with sugar, which is often now referred to as the, a poison to our body. But I was, you know, when we started doing the Daniel Fast and I started paying careful attention to ingredients um, listed on products, you'll be surprised at how much sugar is in almost everything. And that's what makes the Daniel Fast difficult because you try to find what to eat. And that's when we start discovering that everything they seem to pack with sugar. So... Um, Try to discipline yourself to do it. There are things you could find and things you can make. And um, I remember Sister Loris would make stuff and send it for me. Uh, you know, like different people develop great Daniel fast cooking skills. And uh, we were, once during the pandemic, we were thinking about creating a book um, of recipes specific to the Daniel fast. And I, I think it's still something we should pursue. We probably could make some money from it. Because so many people struggle with what to do during that, that phase of the fast. Uh, after we've concluded the Daniel fast on January 25th and 26th, is two days of what is called the Esther fast, and that is like the traditional nothing fast, okay? And um, it's 48 hours, and we try to make sure that we can get through that. And that Friday night, the 26th, we're going to be gathering for uh, all of the night per meeting. So it goes up to midnight and not the overnight prayer meeting that goes to 6 a.m. In the winter time, we go to midnight as opposed to throughout the whole night. Um, so that's the layout of how our fast will go. Now, in the coming weeks, I'm going to um, continue to outline how we're doing, and I'm really calling the whole church, everybody, as, a, as an individual, to this time of consecration. One of the things that... Um, we plan to do with Wednesdays. This coming Wednesday, we had announced already that it's Men's Wednesday. And so even though it's part of the fast, it still will be Men's Wednesday. It's the first one for the year. And therefore, I'm asking all of our men to make an effort to be here on Wednesday um, so that we could start off the year in a time uh, during the consecration where we talk about the challenges that we, we are going to do and our men's leader, Brother Dwight Morgan, is going to be leading 
on Wednesday in that service. The following two Wednesdays, on the, ele the 17th and the 24th, I want to do something slightly different, so lean in with me. Um, those of you who are members of book clubs would know what I'm talking about when I say I want to do something called a verse chat, but in the book world, we call it a book chat, so that a group of friends, a group of people would gather together and agree to read a certain book, and then we book a room at the library, and you go to the library, and you get that room, and everybody have finished reading the book, and you sit down, and you just discuss the whole book, and <coughs> what characters you like, what stories you like, how it's set up, and blah, blah. So you have kids, you know all about that. So what we do also is, um, on a verse chat, what I want us to do, you have these verses that we're going to be reading in the morning and in the evening, on starting on Wednesday the 17th. Now here's where I really want you to pay attention. As you read that, it's one verse, take a moment to just meditate on what you just read. The thing sometimes with us is we, we read everything so fast that we forget that the Word of God is a living Word. And it, it doesn't get stale. And sometimes you'll hear people come and preach. And you wouldn't know how many times people say to me, Pastor, I've read that thing a hundred times. I never saw it that way. And it's like it just came to life all of a sudden. Because the Word of God, you cannot exhaust it. God always will speak to you through His Word. Don't be completely reliant on just hearing from God from here. Amen? When you read your verse, take a moment and just think about what it just said. And what we'll do on starting the 17th, when we gather, and I'm encouraging everybody to come during the consecration to Wednesday night, we are going to discuss, different one of us, what you receive from your verse. We'll have a verse chat. And so everybody might have something different from a different verse that they read. But as you read, one of the prayers that I have in my heart is that if you be obedient and focus on the word, God will show you something from that verse. And when it happens, a good, a good habit to have is to have your notepad. Anybody still write notes? Well, the young people have their phone. So open some kind of note app and make a note of what you read. Because, you know, I, you ask my wife, sometimes things come to me, and I have to jump up out of my bed and, and run downstairs and, and, you know, and start making notes to myself. Um, when I was younger, I'd remember. But uh, now when something comes to me, I write or write it down real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Laugh at me now. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about, Sister Whiteley? Hey, you you got to make notes of stuff these days. And so you get up and you... Because I've had some of the greatest message I've ever received. And I just know that, God, this is amazing. And then I fell back asleep. I, and then when I woke up the next day, I was like, what was that again? And, you know, it's gone from me. But So I want you to make note of what you receive. And then come to church. And I want you to be brave. We're going to create a forum that we can all share different things um, that night with each other and be a blessing to somebody else. One of the people, one of the persons in our church that, that I truly admire with this is Sister Shelly Ann. I would preach or teach sometimes here, and then afterwards she would show me something that the Lord showed her from the very verse that I use, but I didn't see it. And I'd say, Shelly, you, you need to share this with everybody. It's so good. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Does that happen to you too? Sometimes I do something, you know, Sister Cariah, and but, but you, God just shows you something else. So, uh, so I'm going to be away, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But so, so Sister Shelly is going to cover one of these Wednesdays and lead this um, for, for, for us. As we start the year... I'm going to be doing a series of um, preaching uh, that should occupy, and the plan was that it would occupy all of this month, next month, and perhaps into March, because I really want to talk about purpose, and we're going to be showing you some things uh, that I've been preparing on understanding purpose. 
and I kind of have it laid out and just keep asking the Lord to help me to do this right. Um, unfortunately, you know, sometimes we lay out the best plans and things don't always unfold the way that we anticipate them to unfold. So I'm going to start today and Lord willing, next Sunday, Sister Tracy is going to continue for me in the same vein on purpose and then Lord willing, I'll continue after that. Next Sunday, I am going to be away and that is because, um, I'll just give you context, I'm at home in my own church. So when I was about 13, 14 years old or so, my aunt showed up at the house one day with my cousin Paula. And, um, and I, you know, of course, you're a little kid, you can't question your parents about what's going on. But aunt just left Paula. And she, mom, would just, she's going to be living with us now. And so it was just three boys. I had two brothers. And now we had our cousin living with us, Paula. And so in some strange way, we ended up with a sister. And Paula and I went to the same high school. She was a little bit, uh, what, a year or two older than me. So she was in a form higher than me. But she acted as a protection because she was quite feisty. And um, I do remember one day vividly when somebody was trying to mess with me. And, uh, and Paula saw it. And no, nobody messed with me again <laughs> after that. Unfortunately, this week, on the first, Paula passed away. And, um, and so I was, I was tuned in with when she was in the hospital and so on. That my, her sisters contacted me while I was, we were away on Christmas vacation and uh, informed me that she was on life support in the hospital and we were on the prayer meeting asking for prayer for her and so on. So we had to change our life's plan and um, I'm going to be going down to Guyana to help with, uh, with the funeral and to make sure that um, we, you know, take care of that and make sure that Paula gets a good, a good uh, send off, as they would say. So I'm not here on Sunday, but thankfully, Sister Tracy has agreed to uh, continue or cover for me on Sunday, but not just randomly preach anything, but to stay within the same series that um, I endeavored to do. So I'm truly grateful to God for the help and the assistance. And of course, I ask for your prayer, um, for traveling mercies and so on, as we kind of look after some personal things. But I do feel uh, compelled to share the word of God with you today. I am uh, encouraging everybody to, for your own good, for your own personal benefit this year, 2024, that you, you take the time to tune in to God's word. Um, I'm going to be talking about something that means a lot to people only because in so many ways we don't have the answer for it. And that is, what is my purpose? Right? Um, sometimes we think we know, and then other times we think we don't. And we're not sure. We're not sure if God has a purpose for my life. And if so, what is it? And it's disturbing maybe if you get to a certain age and you don't know. When I meet with younger people and they don't know what they want to do for a career, I'm not so worried about them because they've got a little bit of runway to land, right? When, when you get to your midlife and don't know still what you want to do with your career, it's a little bit more concerning, isn't it? You sort of have to know some things by a certain time in life. At least that's what they say. And now, of course, there's exceptions to it. Many people started different careers at much later in life and were very successful. So life doesn't follow a fixed set of rules. But there are some things that you really you should have a good handle on pretty early just to make things safe. We're going to talk about purpose, and you might be quite surprised at how we're going to start this series. Um, so we're going to go to our presentation today. Huh? Got it? Good. And all I'm calling today is 
presentation, if I put it that way, is why. Because encapsulated in purpose is the answer to why. Why am I here? Why do I have to do this? Why am I married to you? Why am I not married? It's also just as valid. I want you to stand. The next verse is of scriptures. So we're going to stand and I'm going to read just two passages. And we're going to try to work from there. I have to take my time because I think with the change of coming from the heat back into the cold and not dressing properly, I kind of messed up and caught a cold and my voice is mad. You know, but it's just a cold. Revelation. So we start at the end of the book. Might seem weird, but we're starting the series from the end of the book. Revelation chapter 4, verse 10 and 11 says, The four and twenty elders fell down before him that sat on a throne, and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure, they are and were created. And for thy pleasure, they exist and they were originally designed for thy pleasure. And then we go to the middle of the book. And Ecclesiastes from the wise man says, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Once again, we go to the end of a thing as we start it. Let us hear the end of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Would you take a moment in this service and just pray for yourself? God, speak to me. Father, we thank you for this year. Thank you for now allowing us to live to see the start of 2024. And Lord, as we gather like this, we need to know your will. We're trying to find out your purpose for us, Lord. And I pray, oh God, that as we go through, as we start this series and as we go through, that you would begin to reveal to each and every one of us not only your universal purpose, but, oh God, the purpose for each and every one of us in our own space. I pray that you would speak, starting this day, not only while we're here at 801, but when we leave this place, I pray you continue to minister to us. As we embark on our fasting, I pray, oh God, that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to, to accept the sacrifices of your children and help us to indeed be drawn closer to you even as we go through this time of consecration. Let it start today. Let it start this moment. Let something be sparked in our hearts with a desire would be birthed in us to be drawn nearer to you, Lord. Surrender it all now, in Jesus' name, amen. And as I always ask you to do before you sit, please do greet somebody and tell them it's good to see them. I hope you meant it. You didn't lie to them right there in the church, but that you meant it, that they can be now. It's good to know that somebody is happy to see you. Amen. We're going to take on, over the next few weeks, the Lord willing, a big debate, a big discussion, purpose. What it is that is, uh, you know, we, you saw, yeah, I think you see on, um, 
our New Year's Eve service, we have these t-shirts that says Year of Purpose. I think what I really would like us to do, like each and everyone to try to do this year is to pursue what exactly is my purpose. Purpose is a beautiful thing. Um, in my study, both in the scripture and outside in, in this realm of psychology, um, trying to prepare myself for this, we start to understand the importance of, of purpose, that passion for anything is driven by purpose. If you know why you're doing something, you will do it. Amen? It's awfully difficult to do things in life when it's meaningless, when you don't really understand why you're doing this. But if you know why I'm asked to do something, uh, this task is given to me, and I understand why I'm doing it, and, you know, I'm devoted to it. I'm, I'm speaking to that, sp especially in, say, the world of business and in your career. When I did my IT career, for example, there was a time that I was very passionate about computers, but at an intellectual level, I really loved the challenge of understanding it and all of that stuff. And then, thankfully, I got a career in there. I got a job where I was able to continue to expand on that interest that I had in computers. And because I was driven by that quest to know about the way systems work, um, I think I did well in, in, the, wor in the world of, uh, of my career in computers. I started out as the tech support guy, so if you call the IT department, I was the person that would come and get onto your desk and try to open up the computers and, and, and try to fix it. Until uh, eventually, because I liked doing this stuff so much, I became the head of IT for the, for the company. So you, you, you realize that when you love something, when you have a, a, a purpose behind what you're doing, it propels you forward. You get a passion for it. That's why we often try to tell and guide young people, find something that you like and you're passionate about. Because once that's there, there are good days and bad days in everybody's job. Amen? You know, sometimes we think that I got the worst job in the world. You're not alone. I think so sometimes too. Even now. <laughs> right? So, it's just, but all of us, we have good days and bad days at work. But what keeps us going, and, you know, bear with me this morning. I really want to just be transparent with you. What would, you can't just work for the money. Right? Because then you'll be, you're not going to like it. You're going to be miserable with it. I remember this lady named Kathy that used to work with me, and, and, and she hated the company. Just hated it, and hated everybody there. And he's like, what, like, what, why don't you work somewhere else? One day I went up to the cafeteria, and she was crying. And I'm like, why are you crying? I hate this place. Are you going to put yourself, and this is somebody who was a long-time employee. She was there for a long time. And so you see, you're putting yourself through all this nightmare. Why? I need the money. You realize you just have one life? Find something that you like. And if you don't like these people, go find some other people to work with. But she had no passion for the job didn't care about the purpose of the existence of the company, didn't care if we were successful or anything. She just needed the money, so she came here, but she lived a miserable life there. Eventually, the company laid her off. You spend your whole time here being miserable and still got nothing out of it in the end. You have to have purpose behind things. I want to start this series, and I really sought the Lord, and I had all kinds of places I wanted to go in this first presentation, and, and then the Lord reeled me in one morning, and um, that's one of those examples where you had to jump out of bed and run downstairs and start to make notes uh, on, on where to start, and it may surprise you, but I'm going to boldly go there and start this. 
You go, oh, is it not working? Oh, here we go. The purpose of why, the purpose is why, the, the why of life. Purpose is the why of life. Why we do, the fundamental reason we live, pursue goals, relationships, etc., is, is driven by purpose. Our sense of purpose will change over the course of our lifetime. And what we are going to be looking at, um, I guess, piques everybody's curiosity because in some way or at some level, we all want to be successful, we want to be happy in life, we want to find, and we believe if we find a purpose behind everything, it's going to spark all of this wonderful stuff. It's going to spark us to be uh, passionate and happy and really self-satisfied with how we're doing in life. And I, you know, really begin to uh, meditate on these things and try to figure out, God, how can I present all of this? And then he just says, no, but, but there's something that comes way before that. Way before we can find happiness, way before we can find what it is that we're supposed to be doing and why we're doing it and how we can get, uh, you know, really fired up about uh, all of this stuff. We need to understand the most important purpose that we have in life. So what then would be the most important thing about finding your purpose, or what is the most important purpose that should possess everybody. And I'm drawn to the back of the book to find, or my attention is pulled to the end of the book, where John, in the book of Revelation, began to show us some things that he saw. And very early in the book of Revelation, you can go to the next slide, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, it says this, and I know we've read it before, but I'm going to read it again. It says, The four and twenty elders fell down before him that sat on the throne and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou has created all things. And everybody say all things. All things. That is the creation of the things you witness, but it's inclusive even of us. And for thy pleasure, there was a reason why God created all things. And the reason that is given from the four and twenty elders in the back of the book, the reason that all things were created is this. It's stated, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So you and I were created for God's pleasure. Okay? Let it sink in. Why did God, if you ever ask yourself, why did God create everything? Well, the answer is in the book. For his pleasure. Things were created to please God. My life, therefore, has been given to me so that it can please God. That's the fundamental reason, purpose, for you and I to be in existence. So that how we live should please God. Amen? If you miss this, you have missed the whole reason for this presentation this morning. I have been created for God's pleasure. So I have to note to myself that whatever I'm doing should be some action, some words, some thoughts that is pleasing to God because that is the purpose that God has created me. I took a side road in the preparation to once again visit the, the whole concept of uh, how 
you know, conception, how it happens. And so I'm not a medical doctor, as most of you know, but I can read. And so even in reading about the, the 40 million to a billion sperm cells that it takes, and you realize that out of that many, one of them will get through and impregnate. And that's you and I. You made it here, which makes you special, which makes it an intentional thing that God has allowed you and I to be here. What is the purpose for his glory, for his pleasure, for his honor? So how are you living? It forces the question upon us then, am I actually living to my fundamental purpose, which is to, bring, to live a life pleasing to God? Is he taking pleasure in how I live, how I conduct myself? in the ways that I execute life, in where I go, in the choice of things that I do. You see, we live so selfishly, and we live so consumed with what pleases us, that we forget the fundamental reason why we're here. The, the, the core purpose of your life and mine is to please God. And I remind everybody, I said it before, and I'll remind you again. When we get so occupied with ourselves that we forget who we are and why and the purpose that we exist, we forget that the same God that we abandon holds our breath in his hands. I know and I'm consciously always aware that it is by the grace of God that I exist. And that everything that I have or even don't have is because of God's grace. Don't ever get so busy this year that you abandoned him who has given you breath. Don't ever get so important that you're too big for church or God. Because in one fail sweep, it can all be gone. It is by his mercies that we're not consumed. Because there is a consumption that continues to destroy people. But somehow, you and I survive. And we make it. I don't... You know, there's some little things you look at in life and you realize that you, you can't understand all of it, but I remember when I came to Canada, the first place I worked was a place called Grafton Fraser Elks, Inc. And I got this job there in data, I was called a data controller. Um, and I stayed there for a while, and when I left, the company went down there. And that was, again, I wasn't such an important person at all that it made a difference to the operation. It's just that I realized that they stayed around, you know, in my own little egotistical way. I said, God, thank you for keeping this place around because I needed that job. I went to work from there to W.H. Smith, a book company. And during my time, it got told and changed hands and so on. But when I left, they went out of existence. That always works. And I got myself into EMI, a really great company, a music business and all of that, 100-year-old company at the time, and so on. And when I left, EMI no, no longer exist. And I started to look at my life and realize that maybe God just keeps me in every place just, just because His mercy and His grace is extended to you and I all the time. Don't take it for granted. Don't let anything trump what you do for God. Let your service, you know, don't make, some people make coming, even coming to church to worship 
uh, is like a huge deal, a big sacrifice. Why do I have to do that? Of course, I go into all these constant debate. People, I don't need to get up and come to church. Why don't you bring the church to me? It's like if there's one, one thing you have to do, you don't debate with a whole lot of places. Uh, you know, you, 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 to me, doing church on, this is going to offend some people, but doing church online is like, you know, going to a restaurant at home. Can't really enjoy food in a restaurant at home. All right? You actually have to go there. I tell people, being in the service is so much better. Amen? So much better. Don't try to force me into doing some kind of, um, what do you call them now? Uber Eats or, you know, Dine, whatever. Like the other one escapes me now. DoorDash. Oh, thanks. DoorDash. Is that the one you use? Okay. <laughs> but that's what people want. Church Dash. <laughs> Send it to me at home. It's not going to work. It's, it's, it's different when you're here. And you're participating. And you lift your hands up with the brethren and worship. Because our purpose, our fundamental purpose, the very first thing is that we are made or created for his pleasure. I want somewhere in this life in 2024 that my life brings pleasure and glory to almighty God. And if it means that one day I have to get up and leave the house and come, it's because I was given the whole rest of the week to do what I wanted to do with it. This moment, I will give it God for the reason you created me. When you come to church, it's not a spectator sport. And for thy pleasure, they are and were created. We have got to live the most important purpose, and that is to please God in how we live. We must. But how does that all work out? How do I make sure that I'm pleasing God? That even in that conversation, there is a starting point of how do we please God? How do I wake up tomorrow and be pleased and live a life that's pleasing to God? Well, I'm glad you ask. Because I want to, I want to leave something that you might think is so mm, fundamental maybe, but it's so critical and it's, the fear is it's becoming lost on Christians and on the church today. So we go to the next slide. What, uh, how can my life bring pleasure to God? And I start with a simple term, repentance. 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 And understanding that I am not perfect and neither are you. And we fail God in so many ways, but we come to everybody else with this pretensive kind of perfect person mentality. Some people are offended when you tell them that they must repent. Amen? I heard one young lady recently, and this, this you know, it's just, I don't know. The Lord must come soon. Because the world is really, people are really getting truly messed up. I heard a preacher the other day, and I, I, I just don't understand how people sit under some things. But if I get down that road, I'll start screaming and behaving bad. So let's not go there. But I heard this young lady talking about somebody preaching and weaponizing the Bible. It's kind of this new kind of thing that everybody... They weaponize the Bible. Telling people that they got to repent. Huh? You think we're weaponizing the Bible. You don't know Jesus. And I'll show you, those of you who are subscribers to that. Um, we don't want to acknowledge that we're messed up. 
We don't want anybody telling us that there's something wrong with you. But what we have to do is we have to come, if you want to see God's purpose beginning to unfold in your life, I want to talk to you about first fixing the relationship that you have with God. Because that's fundamental to any other purpose that you think you're supposed to live by. The first thing is make sure that your life is pleasing to God. Have mercy upon me, O oh Lord. I heard Sister Shelley and as she led this morning talk about, I said, I, every day I need the mercies of God. And I'm there look, hearing Shelley and thinking, she's so perfect. Why would she? I need the mercies of God every day. You see, you see the guy with a suit and a microphone and the title of pastor, and he must have it all together. Well, some of you know he doesn't have it all together. Can't even pretend. But you just get to this place where you understand, Lord, I need you. Have mercy upon me. I, I, just, I just am not, I'm a flawed human being. And for all of these things that I'm believing for to happen in my life, for me to even talk to people about all this purpose stuff, we have got to, as a people, learn how to come humbly before God and ask for mercy and forgiveness and recognize that I have failed God in my thoughts and in my actions. I have sinned. Oh, See, even when you say it from up here, you can feel the resistance. You call in me a sinner? Yes. We all have sinned and come short of his glory. And if we say we have no sin, the truth does not exist within us. It's the reason Christ died. Because we have failed. And God is reaching out to us. So this year, before everything else becomes accomplished, before you can attain all these other purposes that God has established for your life, can I submit to you that we all need to humble ourselves and be repentant before him, acknowledging that, Lord, have mercy upon me. I need you. I need a life that is bringing pleasure to you. I, too many, when we read in the revelation why God created us, why we were created, and why we do exist is for his pleasure. We understand, therefore, is my life pleasing to God? That's what I have to ask myself and submit to you as the pastor. Is your life, please, and nobody else can answer it. Nobody else can answer it. But as a person, as an individual, help me, Lord, to be repentant. To come to that place where even if I can't think of anything I've done, I still say, have mercy upon me, O oh God. People have become so callous, so comfortable in doing wrong that they don't even want to hear that they're doing wrong. We have to tell everybody they're doing right. God loves you no matter how you are. You can keep doing whatever you're doing because you can't outdo the love of God. We've got to be so, so careful. My wife was drawing my attention to this whole, and those of you who are hooked into all this social media stuff, uh, this whole T.D. Jakes things are going on. And I'm not, you know, like, celebrity pastors and preachers, it's a mystery to me, but I saw this one little clip where here's the pastor. He's walking around saying, even if they're right, all I got to do is re sincerely repent. And as I drove and my wife and I were talking about it, he said, you know, there is an issue with presumptuous sins. 
that we must be careful for. Where we, we, we take the grace of God and the mercies of God for granted. And just assume we'll just do anything because I can just always repent. I don't have the time, but there is, there is somebody that did something and it was wrong. And even God tried to talk to him and says, look, if you did well, I would have accepted it. But because you didn't sin lies at your door and he fell. We have to be careful that sincerely in our hearts, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to sin. We're going to fail. We're going to do things wrong. But somewhere inside of us, there's got to be something that separates us from presumptuous sins. Amen? And that we have a sincere desire to walk with him. To please him. Why? Because that's why I was created. For his pleasure. I was and I still exist for him. So in my heart, in your heart, we must be repentant. We must understand that there is something that drives us to say, God have mercy upon me. Help me to wake up tomorrow and not to fall back into this. And not to do this again. Repentance is that thing that lets us turn from sin, from what we know does not please God, and try our very best to live a life pleasing to God. Let me tell you, if you're trying to pursue all the other purpose, and you're going to hear me talking about purpose as we go through this month and next, but if you try to pursue all of this stuff with a life that doesn't please God, you're going nowhere. So I might as well start you from where we really all need to go from. is understanding here is why I'm here. For thy pleasure they are and were created. I have been made so that I can please God in how I live. Don't get so consumed with yourself that you ignore God. There is a call that the Spirit is making to you in this house today. And sometimes God calls the church, even as we prepare to go into our time of consecration, I think it's a good place to start, the place of repentance. Say, God have mercy upon me. Let's not all come in here pretending like we're all so good. We're all messed up. All of our righteousness, the prophet said, is what? Like filthy rags. You can have the longest dress, the fanciest tie. You could dress up and have everything going on on the That's not what God is looking at the outside. Your heart sometimes is so messed up. We got no forgiveness within us. We hold things. And as 24 starts, there's this call. You got to release some things if you want to please God. You got to set go. Let just let go of some things. If you, Lord, have mercy upon me, because I'm not perfect. It's easy to go find what's wrong with everybody else, but the spotlight turns on us in this service, and that call that comes and what you hear in your heart. That's got me just praying and saying, Lord, as I preach, speak to everybody. Give me a church that once again know how to have a broken heart before God. Because, you know, that God is not going to turn away that contrite heart that's seeking after him. If this year you're going to achieve certain things, you want to do that with God. And if it's going to happen that you're going to do it with God, you have to be right with him. It's not going to be perfect every day. I can submit to you that. But that's why we repent every day. That's why we say, Lord, have mercy upon me. Help me. Uh, you know, yesterday I didn't feel like I got it all together. But today as I start my day, please help me, Lord. Before you pray about your purpose and, and try to pursue after it, I am coming here this morning to submit to this church that what we need to do is be a people in complete surrender and repentance before God. 
before I show you and teach you any other principles from Scripture on how we discover and know what our purpose is, the first thing you have to know is why you were created for His pleasure. So live a life pleasing to God. The first step towards understanding what is God's purpose behind all the things that's happening in my life is to understand repentance. I'm drawn to a scripture that is somewhat offensive. Or it's not offensive, but it's insensitive. But I'll share it with you. It's taken from Luke chapter 13. And if... Verse 1 says, And they were present at that season. Some who told him, Jesus, about the Galileans who, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or of those 18 of whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And just in case you, you don't get what's going on here. This is one of these recordings, you know, where Jesus is told about an incident. There was a famous incident, or infamous, depending on how deep your study is, that happened during the time of Christ. And I, I know it's in tiny writings and whatever, but I wanted you to just see a capture from Josephus. Josephus was a Jewish historian or a Hebrew historian who wrote. He wasn't, you know, confined to any particular religion, meaning he wasn't a Christian or a Muslim or anything. Uh, he was just a historian. And he's a well-respected historian because of his sort of, he just, he just recorded history and events that happened and uh, that he just wrote about things that happened at a time when Jesus was in existence. As a matter of fact, reading uh, some of the works of Josephus, you, you find him talking about a man named Jesus who did all kinds of cool things, wonderful things, as, as Josephus would say. So he didn't talk as a, as a follower of Christ. He just recorded as a historian. And he recorded, so we never knew what it was that happened in Luke chapter 13, verse 1. All we know is one day, as Jesus was talking with his disciples, they came to him like we would hear on the news uh, and somebody would say did you know or have you heard and my wife said did you hear there was another shooting at a school uh, and so somebody came to Jesus and said to him um, who told him about the Galileans that had their blood their own blood mingled with the sacrifices that they were killing the 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 goats and the different animals the sheep that they would offer in the temple and somehow this this terrible incident happened where they that Pilate had killed some people but it was so cruel the incident that they mingled the people's blood with the blood of the sacrifices that they were making and it was appalling to the Jews. And I'm sure everybody was talking about this thing. Because Josephus tells us, and, and he gave us a whole breakdown on what the story is. So if you didn't know what happens, what you do is you go to external sources and try to figure out what this is talking about. And Josephus tells us that, that Pilate had made this decision to move water from one place to another and whatever. And some of the, the, the people were upset with this and they started to cause a big commotion. And Pilate decided, uh, he secretly told some of his men that they should not dress like really in their uniform, but just come in and be among the people. Don't have your sword so they can see that you have a sword, but have staves so they almost look like they were shepherds. And they came in among the, the Galileans, 
And at a certain point, he called the people in to express their concern. Tell me what you guys are bothered about. And as they started to talk and, and complain, they took note of all the people who were the complainers. And then at a certain point, Pilate gives a signal, and they start beating the people who were complaining. It caused a stampede, and some people were trampled to death, and some were beaten with these staves by Pilate's people to death. One account says it could have been up to 3,000 people that were involved in this thing. So when something big like that happens, it became news. I don't know if Jesus didn't know about it, but somebody came in this Luke chapter 13 to tell Jesus, did you hear what happened today over there that Pilate mixed the people's blood with the sacrifices. So there was a dead animal that they were going to offer, and there's a dead person beside it. And you would think that Jesus would be very sympathetic to this tragic incident. But instead, he says to them, do you suppose that these Galileans who were a church, they're in the temple. They're trying to offer a sacrifice to God. How could something like this happen there? Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffer such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. If Jesus were to say that to some of these modern people, He would trigger them, <laughs> to use one of their modern terms, right? But what he brought the whole conversation back to was what is fundamentally most important, that we live a life pleasing to God and be repentant within your heart. Unless you repent, just like how other people are suffering, you're going to go through some things, but this, this life is just temporary. There is a greater call upon all of our life and a place that we'll give an account for this life. No, we don't want to hear about it, but let me tell you something. All of us will give an account to God for how we live. So purpose must be established, and that purpose is why am I here? You're here to bring pleasure for his pleasure. You were created. I'm almost done. Let's go to the next slide. And I read it to you. The wise man Solomon give us the conclusion to the whole matter in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. He says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandment, for this is the whole duty of man. The whole reason I live is to fear God. And that doesn't mean to be afraid of God. It means to recognize and acknowledge him in all thy ways. And if you do that, there's another promise that says, He shall direct thy path. Amen? Try your very best as we go into 2024. And I know I'm taking my time with this. But I'm appealing to us not to get so full of ourselves that we lose the ability to repent and to ask God, for forgiveness, to say, Lord, have mercy upon me. It doesn't matter how far you strayed. It doesn't matter because we have all strayed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. And we have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. There is mercy in the house. There is the grace of God in the house. So that when we humble ourselves to start 
this journey of understanding my purpose. And I, I, I'm taking the church through it, and I'm going through it with you. When I started pursuing the Spirit of God to help me understand why certain things are happening. And I entitled this thing, Why? Because that becomes the big question. Why are we struggling with this? Why is this not happening? Why is this not changing? And I find myself really going after answers. And God just stopped me and says, before you try to figure out all of this, understand why I made you. Understand why you are here now. You are here for, take a moment to do something to please me. Because that's why I created you. You're more concerned about why things are not working out for me. God, show me this. Show me this. Lead me here. Lead me there. And I realize that I become so obsessed with my own pleasure. Oh, we could be all honest in here. We're in church. We become so obsessed with my own success and with my own advancement. And that might be the advancement of our church. But understand this. If the church does well, I feel well. So it is fundamental to me that everybody is, is progressing and doing well. And when that's not happening, it troubles me. And then I get to the place where we're pursuant of understanding why are we not getting a revival? Why is this not changing? Why is that not happening? And then God says, because it's not about you. I didn't create you to please you. And I'm not connected to you like Santa Claus. Just so I can provide you with gifts. Because that's the God they preach now. One that just satisfies all of our needs. Prosperity is all God is concerned about. That you drive a certain car and live in a certain neighborhood. And have a certain level of income. And have this kind of successful job. And you realize that none of that stuff brings true happiness. But if we can find a place where my life begins to please him, it changes everything. I don't know how to articulate it to the church, but all I can do is stand and tell you in the best way I can that as a people, this year, before we try to do and accomplish and understand everything, I need to bring us back to that fundamental place where we understand my life is supposed to be for his pleasure. And anything that I'm doing that is not fitting into that frame, I need to repent about and say, Lord, I am sorry. Help me to change the way I live. So I'm gonna, we're going into a time of fasting and prayer as a church. And one of the things I want you to make fundamental during your times of devotion is to look at your life. Look at how you're living. And anything that you know, and you, you know, my prayer is that the Spirit of God would show it to all of us. Anything, if there be any wicked way in me. Remember the Psalms? Touch me. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. I pray. Search me, O oh God. When last did we sincerely do that? So let's stand, please. And as we go into 2024, this is the first like Sunday that we're starting. I'm going to I'm going to ask our musicians to come back. And we're going to sing Search Me, O oh God. I want to ask you to come forward. And we're going to pray together. And we're going to remember now why I am created. For thy pleasure. For thy pleasure. I'd ask Sister Shelley to lead us in, in, in the great song that we sing in church. That's taken from that same verse that we read. 
And it just reminds us. I want to remind everybody. Everybody. And for thy pleasure, they were created. Hallelujah. Make your way up here with me, somebody, and, and, and start the year right. Have mercy upon me, O oh God. Have mercy upon me, O oh God. Hallelujah. Every one of us, let's just, just, just take the time. We're all needing repentance. We all need to remember why we fundamentally are here. What is my purpose, God? that I might please you in how I live. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Pick any one of the two shells and thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Musicians will lead us as they, uh, and the singers will lead. But as you stand in this church, as you stand in this altar, as we stand at the start of a new year, take a moment to ask God for, for forgiveness, for mercy, and begin to set the right foundation, understanding the purpose that God has created you and I. And for his pleasure, they are and were created all things. Every one of us. Search me, oh God, and know my heart today. Try, Try me. me. 